Hello, this is Nigel Goldenfeld at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And uh, this is a practice talk for uh, a session uh, in honor of uh, Bruno Eckhart, who tragically passed away uh, earlier this, uh, this year. Um, so uh, let me, without further ado, go to the talk. So I'm going to talk about work that was uh, done in collaboration with uh, Hong Yang Shi at the University of Illinois and Academia Seneca, and then also uh, Gauda Linga, Joachim Mattison at the Niels Bohr Institute, and Gregoire Lemur, Mukun Vasu Devon, and uh, Bjorn Hoff uh, at uh, the IST in Austria. So my first encounters with uh, Bruno Eckhart uh, were when he was a uh, editor of Physical Review E, and I had a number of papers that were going through there. And, uh, and Bruno was a, 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 an exceptionally uh, conscientious and fair and, and, and reasonable editor. And uh, he, he helped us in, in enormously. Later on, uh, I came to, uh, to know him through uh, our joint interests in uh, dynamical systems and uh, turbulence. And uh, in particular, um, uh, this, this paper, um, this, this, this paper, um, uh, of which he was the uh, senior author, and, uh, and two of the other authors are going to be speaking at this, uh, at this special session, uh, came out in Nature in 2006. And this paper made the remarkable uh, uh, claim that uh, the lifetime of turbulence uh, in shear flows was actually uh, finite. In other words, it does not diverge, but increases uh, exponentially with the Reynolds number. And this suggests that turbulence is a metastable or transient uh, state. And, um, and, and then they suggested this could be uh, a way of controlling turbulence. Now, since that time, uh, we have learned that this is not quite uh, correct. In, in fact, that the behavior of, uh, of turbulence in a pipe uh, certainly does not diverge at any uh, critical Reynolds number but in fact increases not exponentially, but super exponentially with Reynolds number. And I want to spend a few minutes just recapitulating that uh, now. So uh, here is uh, the setup from a, a later experiment uh, done by uh, Bjorn Hoff, uh, uh, looking at the question of, will a turbulent path survive to the end of the pipe? So you take a pipe where the flow is linearly stable uh, and you in, 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 in inject a disturbance at this point over here, and that then uh, creates a, a turbulent puff that travels down the pipe and either decays by the time it gets to the end or lives uh, by the time it gets to the end. After many repetitions of this experiment, one can then estimate the survival probability of a puff of turbulence as a function of Reynolds number and as a function of time. And when you do that, this is the phase diagram that you find. So this is a uh, computer simulation uh, by Avila et al. of, a, of a, a puff. The color scale shows the turbulence intensity. And in this regime up to Reynolds numbers of about uh, 2040 or so, puffs are metastable. This puff will simply decay. And its survival probability, as you can see uh, here, uh, decays exponentially with time. And the time scale is the uh, puff lifetime uh, plotted as a function uh, of Reynolds number here. This is a logarithmic scale. This has upward curvature, and so it's growing faster than uh, exponential. As you go to higher Reynolds numbers, puffs actually split, and you get a regime that we call spatiotemporal intermittency. And in that regime, uh, one finds that the mean time between, between splitting events is actually uh, also uh, a time that gets shorter and shorter as you go to large Reynolds numbers uh, and gets smaller, uh, gets smaller at large Reynolds numbers and gets longer as you go uh, to lower and lower Reynolds numbers. And again, when you plot the mean time between splitting events, it has upward curvature on this semi-log plot, indicating that this, in fact, is, uh, is growing faster than exponential. If you take the double log plot, what you find is that these uh, curves intersect at a critical Reynolds number around about uh, 2040. Uh, and essentially what we've learned from this is that the critical timescales of turbulence near the uh, critical Reynolds number to grow uh, super exponentially with this uh, scaling law as shown here. So what is the theory for this transition? So I'm going to now spend a few minutes talking about the theoretical side and then coming back to the question of the timescales. So 
from our perspective, the transition to turbulence is a transition to a non-equilibrium state, and that uh, non-equilibrium state uh, may have non-equilibrium phase transitions, and so it behooves one to try to understand what they are. Now, in equilibrium critical phenomena, as is well known, one starts off with the electronic structure at the lowest level of description. One then goes to an effective model at, uh, uh, at, at a larger length scale, uh, typically, say, an Ising model. That model is too hard to solve, and so one looks at a, 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 an effective theory uh, in the symmetry group of the Ising model, and from that, one deduces the, the normalization group universality class. And in fact, what one sees is that very close to the critical temperature, the magnetization, which is the order parameter, is very weak, but it grows in a way that is uh, given by a critical exponent beta. And similarly, at the critical uh, temperature, uh, one sees a breakdown of linear response theory with the magnetization not being proportional to external field, but the external field proportional to some power. These results in equilibrium statistical mechanics can all be combined into a uh, similarity or, or scaling formula. Now, what happens in turbulence? Well, at the lowest level of description, one has a kinetic theory. Then one has a, a, an effective description of coarse grained, which is the Navier Stokes equations. And then the question that I want to talk about is what is the equivalent of the Landau theory and what is the renormalization group universality class? So to identify the long wavelength and weak collective modes at the laminar turbulence transition, we did direct numerical simulations of the Navier-Stokes equations. And what we found was that in essence, there are two important modes near the transition. One of these is uh, this, at smaller wavelengths is the turbulence itself, shown in green here, but we found a weak a uh, zonal flow mode, a, a k equals zero mode, whose radial structure is non-trivial and time dependent, as shown here in the inset. And importantly, these two modes uh, had energies as a function of time, which fluctuated 90 degrees out of phase. And the reason for this, we eventually became clear when we started looking at the details of these modes. What's happening, in fact, is that the anisotropy of the turbulence is creating uh, Reynolds stress, which generates a mean velocity in the azimuthal direction. This mean azimuthal velocity, the zonal flow, decreases the anisotropy of turbulence and thus suppresses it. So what happens is you have turbulence inducing a zonal flow. That zonal flow then suppresses the turbulence, and that suppression then uh, uh, causes the zonal flow to go down again, and therefore the turbulence is now free to uh, rise. And so what you get is essentially what is a predator-prey oscillation that you are familiar with, perhaps, in uh, simple models of ecosystems. Ecosystems have predator and prey. They oscillate 90 degrees out of phase in these rather noisy oscillations, as you can see here. And so there seems to be an analogy between the zonal flow being a predator and the turbulence as being uh, a prey. We can model these uh, uh, predator-prey models uh, using a stochastic uh, simulation. And so we understand a lot about how these things uh, can be uh, represented in terms of statistical mechanics. Now the Landau theory for this is a stochastic predator-prey system. And let me just show you how one uh, arrives at that. What one does is one writes down all the vertices that one can get from a, a quadratic nonlinearity in the Navier-Stokes equation, where the curly line represents turbulence, the solid line represents the zonal flow, and there's a third trophic level, if you will. It's the laminar flow, which provides the energy for the whole of the turbulence. That uh, uh, can be represented in predator-prey terms as a, a predator, uh, A, and a prey, B, and E being the food, or if you like, an empty site. Each of these diagrams, these Feynman diagrams, represents a stochastic process. For example, this one here represents turbulence encountering a zonal flow and the zonal flow itself then being uh, 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 generated further and suppressing the turbulence. And in predator-prey language, what that means is the predator encounters the prey, in this case the, uh, the turbulence, uh, suppresses it and then has enough energy to make two baby predators. And that's this process shown here. So this is a stochastic predator-prey ecosystem. And now we can ask, does this 
tell us anything about turbulence. And what I'm going to show you next is that it recapitulates the phase diagram, generates the lifetime statistics, and it predicts the universality class. So here's the phase diagram that you've already seen. Up at the top is the phase diagram for turbulence. At the bottom is the phase diagram for this stochastic predator-prey model that we have arrived at. The ax axis along here is not Reynolds number, it's the prey birth rate. And what you see happening is that at low prey birth rate, the prey uh, cannot avoid being uh, eaten by the predators, and so eventually they die and the whole system dies out. That's the nutrient only phase. If, on the other hand, the prey make babies frequently enough, then their population is not uh, necessarily going to die out immediately. And so you get a state where if you make a spatially varying uh, population of predator and prey, eventually it will decay, just like the single puff decays. And finally, if you go to a higher birth rate, what happens is this initially stable, this initial spatially localized state will split into two uh, traveling waves, just like the puff splitting that you see here. If you then look at the world lines, where the color tells you about the population of the prey, the color here tells you about the population of the turbulence, the turbulence intensity, then what you see as a function of space and time is you see this spatiotemporal chaos, this very branching complex phase here. And what one can do in the predator-prey model is measure the statistics of the extinction time and the statistics of the time between the first population splitting event. And when you do that, this is what you see. Over on the right-hand side are the data you already saw from the Hoff group as uh, experiments and simulations on turbulence. Over here is data from the predator-prey model. The predator-prey model knows nothing at all about the Navier-Stokes equations, and yet it is recapitulating what we see in the lifetime statistics. So what we've learned is that the extinction in ecology, that transition, is like the death of turbulence, if you like, the turbulence to lamina transition. Now, there's other ways that one can model uh, the, uh, the onset of turbulence. Uh, the uh, most well-known uh, model is one proposed by uh, Dwight Barclay, where he looks at the interactions between puffs and, uh, and uh, argues that the turbulent patches behave like an excitable medium, uh, such as you might have on a nerve fiber. And of course, they interact through the mean shear in a way that everybody understands. So the turbulence is like the nerve voltage. The mean flow is like the ion channel recovery. And this model has been very successful in uh, recapitulating the phase diagram of turbulence, including uh, the, puff, uh, uh, the puffs uh, to slug uh, transitions. In the model I've just shown you, we're just focusing on one particular puff. And, uh, that, and we've seen that that puff will uh, undergo all, all these splitting events, uh, as, we've, as we've described. But we've only focused on one puff. And now the question is, what happens when we couple the puffs, when we include the mean shear as well? So what happens when we do that is that uh, we see that the uh, predator-prey model uh, and the, uh, and the um, uh, excitable media descriptions are completely equivalent. Both of them predict a phase diagram where you start off with a localized puff that can decay and then at higher Reynolds numbers uh, you get a what's called a, strong, a weak slug and then a strong slug regime as shown uh, in these pictures here and in these over here. So both the phase diagram and the kinematics of puffs and slugs are captured by these two uh, descriptions which are, are essentially equivalent ways of describing uh, what is going on uh, uh, near the transition of turbulence. Now, what we're interested in is the universality class. And uh, what I've shown you so far is that starting from Navier-Stokes, one finds near the transition a two-fluid model, uh, which is in the predator-prey universality class. And now I'm going to show you that this transition is actually directed percolation. And we get there by going through some statistical mechanics of a field theory. So directed percolation is the idea that uh, turbulent regions can spontaneously uh, relaminarize, go into an absorbing state, but they can also contaminate their neighborhood with turbulence. And Yves Pomeau was the first person uh, to uh, point that out and, um, and, um, and is uh, uh, in a very prescient paper from 1986. 
Now, for those of you who just joined, we're doing a practice here. So please uh, don't connect your audio. Thank you very much. Okay, so in directed percolation, there are four different uh, uh, basic processes that tell you how you percolate on a, on a space-time lattice, annihilation, decoagulation shown here, uh, diffusion where uh, you go to one time step like this, and coagulation where at the previous time step, two occupied sites go to one occupied site. So these are the four basic processes that underlie percolation always going downwards in time uh, and percolating to a site with probability P if one uh, exists. This system exhibits a phase transition in, the, uh, in a particular universality class at low percolation probability, uh, you can't find a way through the system. At high percolation probability, you can always find a path. And at the critical point, you just manage to get through. And if you look at long times and measure how many occupied sites there are at long times down here, what you find is that here, of course, there are none. Here, of course, there are many. And here, uh, they go to zero um, as you go towards the percolation probability. Uh, uh, critical PC, and it goes to zero with an exponent beta. So what happens in, uh, in pipe flow? Well, this is a simulation of pipe flow in three plus one dimensions. And you can see what's happening is you start off with a region of turbulence, the puff, and then it gradually decays. So the green squares there, the pixels, represent uh, the uh, uh, sites that are uh, turbulent. If I write this down in one dimension, you can see that we're starting here with a, uh, a, a line, which is the occupied sites. And then as a function of time, those occupied sites eventually decay until this is the last pixel uh, that decays. So what happens then is that the active state persists until the most long-lived percolating strand uh, decays. In other words, the longest path is the maximum amongst these independent randomly percolating paths. And that suggests that the lifetime statistics is going to be controlled by extreme value statistics. Now, extreme value statistics addresses the question of what happens when you take a set of random variables xi and look at the probability distribution, not of their mean, but of their maximum. And the answer is, and this was worked out by Fisher and Tippett long ago, is that there are three distributions, but the one that concerns us here that has a cumulative distribution that goes as e to the minus e to the minus y. The same super exponential function that we saw uh, earlier on in the lifetime statistics that Bjornhoff had measured. Now, how do we understand the universality class of directed percolation arising from a predator-prey ecosystem? Here are the basic processes of predator and prey dynamics in a spatially extended scenario where I and J represent spatial labels. What you can see here is that the basic processes of birth of the prey, death of the prey, predation that we already talked about are represented here in space and in time. Now near the transition, the prey population is small. And so the predators cannot survive. So we'll just cross out those terms. And then you are left with these four interactions. These are now a three trophic level system has now turned into a two trophic level system. We just have the energy of the laminar flow and the turbulence itself. And those basic processes can be written down diagrammatically as shown on the right here. In other words, the four basic processes of directed percolation. So near the extinction transition, stochastic predator prey dynamics reduces to directed percolation. And I've shown it here graphically, but this was uh, explained uh, by Mobilio et al. Uh, more than 10 years ago uh, using path integration and so on and so forth. Now, what about the experiments? Well, there's a very famous experiment that you'll hear uh, some more about from Bjorn's talk later. Um, and in Bjorn's talk, uh, what he will tell you about are experiments on, uh, on a correct apparatus, uh, uh, where you have the outer cylinder rotating. You look at the dark regions, which are the turbulence. You look at them as a function of time. Uh, you take a, a snapshot around the outer cylinder. You stack these up uh, vertically like this, and you produce, uh, with blue now being turbulence and yellow being laminar, you produce a world line of turbulence, which looks strikingly like the directed percolation pictures I showed you earlier and they fit them quantitatively as well. So here is the best fit to the turbulent fraction from this experiment uh, compared with the exponent from DP, and it, it works very well. 
you can do the same thing, of course, with a predator-prey ecosystem model. And uh, this is what you see, starting with uh, two localized regions, uh, the population dynamics uh, uh, traces out a directed population structure. So we've got two different ways to think about directed percolation in the context of transitional pipe flow. In one of them, uh, we think about uh, each uh, turbulent region as being a pixel. There's no internal structure of the puffs. And that's how we get these pictures from uh, the correct experiments of, of Buren. The other picture, excuse me, the other picture is the one uh, shown here that we've talked about, where we're looking inside a single puff and we're looking at the directed percolation dynamics inside that single puff. And we've seen how that reproduces the super exponential scaling that is the topic of this talk. Now, in two dimensions, we also know from computer simulations done by Chantry, Tucker, and Barclay that uh, Wallef flow also uh, produces uh, the scaling signatures of directed percolation. Okay, so now we have an interesting question, which I propose to address in the last uh, 10 minutes of this talk. We've seen that in pipe flow, one has a super exponential scaling of the critical exponents, uh, but we don't have any, any parallel scaling as one might have expected. This was the point that, uh, that, uh, that Bruno talked so much about in that 2006 paper. On the other hand, when we look at the uh, correct experiments, we see critical phenomena, we see power law behavior, but we don't see super exponential. So what I want to understand now is what's going on here. What is the explanation of the super exponential scaling and why don't we see critical uh, exponents in that uh, pipe flow? So let's start off by talking about the origin of the super exponential scaling. So I've already told you about uh, extreme value statistics, and that's recapitulated here. That if you have a bunch of random variables, xi, and they're identical and ind independently uh, distributed, their mean will be normally distributed, and that's the central limit theorem, excuse me, but their maximum uh, will be distributed according to this distribution here. So the first hypothesis that you might say is this. If the maximum turbulent energy over the space within a puff is below a Reynolds dependent threshold, then the puff will decay. So in other words, if the energy as a function of space looks like this, then you're going to decay. If on the other hand, it always persists above some threshold, it will always have enough energy to sustain itself. And then you would say that that threshold, uh, 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 Emax would follow a fischer tippett uh, gumbel distribution. Now what you can work out then is the following. The decay rate is basically related to the uh, survival probability of, uh, the, of the puff decaying in a particular time window, uh, let, let's call it uh, t to t, t naught. So then the probability of, of, the, of, the, of, um, of the puff decaying uh, 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 by time t is given by one minus the survival uh, probability in that small time window tau naught to the power how many time windows there are, that's t minus t naught over tau naught. And if you then work out what the decay rate is, it goes like t over p naught. Now the spontaneous decay probability is determined by the fact that the maximum energy of a set of voxels in the puff fails to attain a Reynolds number dependent threshold y. So that means that the probability p tilde over here is then given by the extreme value distribution for the probability that the energy is less than this threshold. In other words, this uh, cumulative distribution given by the Gumbel distribution, the fischer tippett gumbel distribution. And then if you do some algebra and make some change of variables, that leads to a super exponential scale. Now this assumes that the fluctuations at each patch are independent, which is perhaps not true near the laminar turbulent phase transition, because normally one expects that near a transition, the fluctuations become strongly correlated. And you can see that happening in this picture here. So here, this is meant to be the uh, this is meant to be the correlation length, and in, and if the correlation length is not too large compared to the diameter of the pipe, then you would expect to see three plus one dimensional directed percolation. But if, on the other hand, you're close to the transition and this correlation length is wider than the radius of the pipe or longer than the size of the puff in the longitudinal direction, then you would get one plus one dimensional 
dimension punctuation. You'd see dimensional crossover, and we in fact checked that uh, using careful simulations in the paper that I wrote in 2011 with Maxim Sibbles. Now, another uh, area where you see super exponential scaling arise is in the universal finite size scaling of fluctuations near critical points. And this was a famous paper uh, written by Bramwell et al. in about, uh, about uh, 20 years or so ago. Well, what they looked at was the fluctuations in a confined uh, uh, turbulence of a so-called French washing machine experiment. And they showed that the data for the probability distributions of power fluctuations matched exactly the fluctuations in the order parameter in the equilibrium 2D XY model in a finite size system. And they were able to understand this in some detail um, um, uh, uh, technically, and there's also uh, the connection between the two was also explained in a paper that I wrote around about 2001 with Vivek Arji. What's happening is that this uh, distribution, this, uh, this distribution here that they observed, the so-called BHP distribution, is pretty much uh, universal and in fact is, has the same uh, scaling behavior as the fischer tippett gumbel distribution does. Now, what does that have to do for, uh, for the pipe flow turbulence? Well, if I now have correlated random variables whose distribution decays sufficiently fast at infinity, then the sum of these random variables can be shown to be distributed according to a BHP-like distribution as shown here. And you can read about this in these interesting papers by uh, Burton and Cluzel from about uh, 15 years or so ago. So let's take that as a given and then redo our argument as we had before. But now we're going to make the hypothesis that if the average turbulent energy of the space within a puff is below a Reynolds dependent threshold, then the puff decays. So now you have this picture here, the act, the, before we had the maximum, now we're just saying the total energy should be above that. And if it's below it, then the puff doesn't have enough energy to sustain itself. So if you then uh, work that out, then the, uh, the critical threshold follows a BHP distribution and working through the algebra, you once again uh, get an asymptotics which looks like a super exponential scale. Now, I don't think either of those explanations are, are completely uh, the full story because I think what's also going on here is you have a complicating effect due to finite size scaling. And finite size scaling in this case can lead to a fluctuation induced first order transition. And this is work in progress, but I want to give you some flavor of how we're thinking about this. So if you have a phase transition very close to the transition, it's already well known that uh, close to the critical point, uh, what you get are logarithmic corrections to Landau theory, which lead to a nucleation barrier. And here's an example. This is a, a calculation that you'll find in the PhD thesis of Barrett Freeman from about 10 years or so ago, just looking at this stochastic equation, which is the non-spatial part of the stochastic equation that describes directed percolation. And what you can see happening is that as you vary the, uh, the, the magnitude of the multiplicative noise here, what happens is you get the effective potential, which has a, a, uh, an induced um, uh, barrier uh, to go from this state to the zero state. Uh, that's called a fluctuation induced first order transition and would lead to nucleation from there. Indeed, this point was already understood uh, and had been observed uh, by uh, Binder in 1982, Dome in 1998 and, and others. And here, as I'm, I'm showing you uh, calculations done by a, a renormalization group by Dome, uh, showing the relaxation time, the, the ergodicity time, if you will, near a, uh, an Ising model and showing this of logarithmic behavior as a function of T minus TC. And again, you see the super exponential behavior of the time scale. You can see this directly in uh, numerical simulations. These are the energy of a turbulent puff as a function of time. And this is the occupation number of directed percolation as a function of time. Very far away from uh, the critical Reynolds number, you see that the, uh, the turbulent energy very quickly decays. But as you go close to the critical Reynolds number, the, uh, the, the puff lives for a long time and then suddenly decays. Or over here in directed percolation, it lives for a long time and then eventually uh, decays like so. And so what we're seeing happening here is near the transition, we have decay being controlled 
uh, by nucleation. So the metastable turbulent state uh, spontaneously decays to lamina after a large fluctuation pushes the system over the energy barrier. So why do we see critical exponents in pipe flow? Well, the reason is that there's a multitude of finite size effects. Then we have finite time of measurement in pipe flow. We have the finite size of the pipe diameter, and we have the finite size of the pipe length. The longitudinal dimensions of puffs are determined by the shear interactions, and so the fluctuations are limited by the streamwise, streamwise length of the puff, about 20 pipe diameters. So we can see this uh, by doing simulations of directed percolation. So what we do is going back to a, a model here, this is one plus one dimensional directed percolation. We count the number of occupied sites at, at each time. And then when we, uh, we, we plot the decay rate uh, in the same way that one does in the, uh, in the Hoff uh, experiments. And uh, what one finds is that the survival probability has a functional form that has a, a super exponential scaling uh, that looks very much like the experimental data. Now, if you have um, uh, near PC, the effective number of independent degrees of freedom uh, is reduced due to the correlations because the system size is now re effectively reduced because the correlated correlation length has got larger and larger. If you have a single seed at long enough times, its survival probability is one minus e to the minus t over ts, the survival probability. For n independent ones, it's that to the nth power. And then the total survival probability as you take the limit n goes to infinity is indeed the, uh, the Gumball uh, distribution that we've talked about before. And we can see that uh, in our simulations of directed percolation. So here I'm looking at directed percolation for a large system size. And what you see is that over here, uh, you do see power law scaling, but a slight deviation is perceptible here near the critical point due to the finite size. And you can measure uh, that uh, probability distribution and see that it fits the functional form that I showed you before. Now what happens is uh, let's, let's now change uh, the system size. So now let's make the system smaller. And now this regime where the power law behavior uh, is not observed uh, has been increased. And we see uh, close to the transition, super exponential uh, scaling. And that is shown uh, over here where we plot the numerical data versus the finite uh, uh, N form of the Gumbel distribution. So what we've learned is that the lifetime scales with the directed percolation exponent away from the critical point, but close to the critical point, finite size effects cause a crossover to extreme value statistics. And this extreme value statistics region increases as the system size gets smaller and smaller, as shown here. So what we're seeing then is a crossover scaling. This is uh, the relevant operator, one over the system size, as a function of PC minus P. And what is happening is that as we go, uh, as we go uh, down in, in P, we start off at this regime over here, seeing the true critical behavior. Then we cross over to uh, close to the transition when the correlation length is larger than the system size. We cross over to a regime where you see a deviation from the true critical behavior. And that, as I've shown you, is super exponential scaling. So what you're seeing then is as you vary the system size, you're going through this regime uh, earlier and earlier in, in PC minus P. And so the regime where you see the super exponential scaling has been amplified. So let me summarize then. What is the explanation of the super exponential scaling? What we're seeing is that the lifetime of turbulence is determined by a nucleation process into the lamina state. And the statistics of barrier crossing is dominated by extreme value statistics, taking into account correlations. Why don't we see critical exponents in pipe flow? In, in finite systems, the regime close to the critical point is dominated by this correlated extreme value statistics. And so you see the super exponential uh, behavior. Now, is there experimental evidence for directed percolation in pipe flow? Well, that is a topic of another talk that will be given uh, at the uh, meeting. Uh, that is a talk uh, given by Hong Yang Shi. Uh, the session number is W2507. And in, in this talk, uh, uh, you'll learn 
uh, how we measured uh, the effective interactions between paths and then used a renormalization group and numerical simulations uh, to show that the statistics uh, are indeed uh, those of directed perturbations. And this talk is going to be available online uh, later this week. So that's where I'm going to leave it and uh, thank you uh, for your uh, attention.